Well, thank you so much. And this, I think, is our final panel of the day, which is very sad because it's been such a marvelous day. We have um, a really fascinating group of people here to talk about um, reimagining leadership. Uh, you've heard a couple of my colleagues who are professors at the London Business School uh, really describing with huge vigor and vim how the world has got to change and will change. But of course, the question to our uh, industry leaders is how much do you see that happening? So before I sit down, let me just introduce uh, each one to you. Can I introduce, first of all, Greg? Greg Case, who's the CEO of Aon that employs 66,000 people around the world, really global, uh, and works in the field of global risk management and insurance solutions. So I suppose, in a way, in our, in our group here, Greg represents the person who's leading a huge workforce, very globally distributed, and must be facing some amazingly interesting issues, which I'm sure we'll hear about at, at any moment. Well, Greg, in many ways, of course, you, you're the most unfortunate person on the this. The dinosaur. Yeah. Yes. No, no, you're not the not dinosaur, dinosaur, but you're, you know, you're the one who's actually running a, a legacy business with 66,000 people. Do you give people 20% time off? Well, I'm looking about the 20% time. Yeah, I'm like intrigued them. by the Sunday. That's a good idea, too. <laughs> what, what do you, yes, the, yes, yeah, well, yes, that would be bad, wouldn't it, giving people a Sunday off. Um, what do you think about this uh, idea that Richard's got to do with opening up all the data? Do you do that? Yeah, I, I would say, first of all, just um, Aon is a firm with 67,000 colleagues, yeah. that's true. We do touch risk in people, true. But the reason I really wanted to be here and really appreciate just hearing Easy and Richard talk about what they're doing is fundamentally we want to change the world of risk. We want to help clients understand, measure, mitigate risk and really change the global economy through the lens of risk. Mm -hmm. And we want to do the same thing through the lens of people, thinking about, frankly, talent and health and retirement. If we can change the global economy on those two areas, we fundamentally had real impact. We fully recognize Without an evolution in technology and data and insight, we're not going to make it happen. In fact, we're going to lose. We've got to get ahead of that game. Our view is if we don't innovate faster than our clients on the topics of risk and people, we fundamentally lose. And that's forced us to do a lot, spend hundreds of millions of dollars on data, which, by the way, in the end, we have found not helpful. And so you translate data into information, information into insight, and insight into changes in client behavior. If fundamentally you don't change client behavior, you've created no economic value. Therefore, you've got no impact. And what these gentlemen are describing rings true in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. I find myself thinking about, though, how do you take these great ideas and scale them mm -hmm. across 67,000 colleagues? And more important, how do you scale it across a set of clients who've got a set of fundamental issues? So our view is, you know, I have, happen to operate in an industry around that has a lot of data, uh, much less insight. And our whole effort is translating data into insight and doing it in a way that clients can measure economic value. So our view is operating performance, balance sheet strength, and reducing volatility. If we can do specific, take specific actions out of clients that will drive value in a unique way, we can create value. So yes, we're, we're taking efforts around data, around analytics, some of the most fundamental things we're doing in the firm, and the innovations really come from our colleagues, the insights they bring to the table, uh, and from our clients as we listen to our clients around what their issues are. So I can very much relate to what uh, these colleagues are talking so, about. So, so in terms of the five you know, insights that we'd like to bring from this session, what would be your specific insight from what you've learned doing you know, the, the, you, the process you've described? I, I don't know if we can sort of call it one insight, but what I would observe, just listening to the conversation, it, it is the translation of this whole broad conversation into impact. And, and by the way, that requires innovation too. Because uh, you can you can churn for hours and years and you know decades on data analysis and not translate it into insight. And I think really understanding client need and translating the data, the analytics into something that's tangible for a client is fundamental. Uh, that's really what makes Aon go. And I would guess that's where you know that's where your startups are going to have impact. That's where you know your business is going to have impact if you don't translate it into something, an action. Then it's uh, it's an interesting analysis, a nice little speech, but it doesn't really produce results. And what's the process by which you would translate this into action? I mean, what, what is it that you do that allows you to do that, do you Well, think? I'll give you one quick example. So uh, a lot of our clients around the world uh, worry about global supply chain. Many of you probably touch global supply chain. By the way, for years and years and years, everyone's tried to develop a global supply chain primarily so they could reduce cost. Uh, what that's actually done fundamentally is reduce costs. They've had great success with that. Our, our clients have also, though, introduced substantial volatility variation in their supply chain. And so data and analytics can actually help you measure volatility versus cost reduction. So you're in essence saying to a client, what's more important to you? 
increases in EPS or volatility of EPS. If you actually understood that trade-off truly for a manufacturer globally, you'd be making very specific and very different decisions you'd make if you're just doing cost optimization. Mm -hmm. That's, by the way, one teeny tiny little sliver all through data and analytics. If you don't track exactly what's going on in all the options, you fundamentally can't help a client make a different decision. If you can't do that, they can't change behavior, and they can't actually improve their economic performance. That's one little one little so, so just the data and the analytics, that sounds to me like a very specialized job to be able to do that. I mean, do you, one of the, you know, one of the things that people are talking about at the moment is this notion of hollowing out of work that, um, you know, if you take a look at the skill sets around, then the middle have disappeared. The middle, letter, middle set of skills have gone. The medium level skills have gone because they've either been automated or outsourced. And what's left is jobs that are becoming more difficult, more complex, more specialized, or jobs that are relatively easy to do and, and for all sorts of reasons can't be, can't be um, re replaced. But, but, but Greg, just, you know, one of the things that really came across when you spoke is that you must have some pretty talented people around to be able to do that data analytics. Yeah, but I, I would, we have got some great colleagues, and they've fundamentally hired more and more. I'll have to be talking to these gentlemen as we walk off the stage. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, about, about their colleagues, of course, not, not them, as we're saying. <laughs> we'll take, LBS will take its normal 20% on that exactly. one, by the way. Um, but I would offer, yes, it's, a rec it's an important skill, but don't lose sight. We have 67,000 colleagues who've been, done wonderful work over time. And, and to the extent we can use data and analytics to take a, uh, someone who's actually been a broker for, a many, for many, many years and give them a level of insight to, for example, do instant, instant benchmarking globally around uh, the placement of risk or understanding of risk. So cyber is a big deal. So what's going on in cyber? If we can actually, from an analytic standpoint, give, give someone a true global view of that in their back pocket and they can deliver that to a client, we're actually taking a role and actually we're making it much, much more powerful. And in essence, taking someone, as long as they don't, and there's an there's amount, amount of concern here too, we're not replacing what you do, we're in fact helping you do what you've done historically much better, much faster, much more powerful and to the extent we use data and analytics. So we run $100 billion of risk every year. If we get the data and analytics around that correct, we don't, but if we got it correct, that's non-duplicatable differentiated value. That, in the, in the hands of a broker, same person, fundamentally changes how they can do business. So we're, we're very careful around, you know, it, absolutely disruptive, but let's be clear. Our colleagues are exceptional and they evolve. We all have to evolve. So, 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 so um, how many people here, can you just put the lights up, think that their job will be replaced by data analytics within the next 10 years? Hands up if you think that's the case. Just one person. We actually, I think ours might be, in fact, a, a <laughs> business school professors. So, I mean, Greg, are you, you know, six, the research currently suggests that 67% of work will be replaced by data analytics. So, I don't, I can't believe that you're saying that you're just giving all that stuff to people and they're still, I mean, why would you need to have the salesperson to do it if yeah. the data analytics is think, doing it for them? I think them? be careful of the power of evolution versus the power of replacement. Uh, we're not saying your job's not going to be fundamentally different, but, uh, and by the way, if you can't evolve, you might be replaced. But if you can evolve, um, the difference between actually a personal relationship with truly powerful insight uh, is pretty fundamental in our world. We typically serve companies, by the way, as opposed to individuals. And we are seeing disruptive technology come in and truly replace uh, the personalized parts of our business uh, very pretty fundamentally. But so for us, we're not suggesting it's one or the other, but there's a big difference between ev evolution uh, and development and just fundamental replacement. We're open to both, and by the way, in essence, we're attacking our business every day, but we've seen tremendous benefit uh, and the evolution of our colleagues using data and analytics to give them greater insight to serve clients more effectively. So, so experimentation with management, which is what Gary was talking about. I mean, rather, how, what about how do you experiment with how you manage people? H have you used experimentation with how you manage people? Um, Greg? Well, I just, there's, uh, by the way, less experimentation, more trying, I guess I would start with. Um, but the whole role that technology plays as you think about enabling uh, talent-based experimentation or really just evolution of your organization, uh, we find uh, it's, we wake up days and it's stunning. Uh, in essence, our 67 southern colleagues are spread out in 120 countries around the world. Yeah. Um, the power of Aon is, is not just the individuals, it's the connectivity. Yeah. We, so, we call it Aon United. When we connect our global firm, we are so much more powerful. 
by the way, how do we connect our global firm and a firm that historically hasn't been connected? You reach the technology, you try things, you work together, you try to support each other. Uh, you also have to have a set of incentives that reinforce that, which, by the way, haven't historically been the case. This is a real problem, right? You can yeah. say it, and it's nice, and it's theoretical, but in the end, it, how do you make it happen? So we work really hard uh, trying, to, uh, trying to use different approaches, technology, um, connectivity. By the way, that connectivity means a lot of times it didn't come from me. Right? Long gone are the days where you know, somebody at the top or at the bottom, wherever you sort of calibrate a CEO, says, here's what's going on, and everybody goes, yes, because everybody's talking to each other. So if there's not consistency between what you're saying around the mission and the objectives of the firm and what your colleagues are saying, there's, this is tremendously accelerating. Either you accelerate positively or you accelerate negatively. Technology means you are not staying the same, yeah. period. And so we think the organizational implications, the talent implications, as both of you were mentioning at the beginning, are quite profound as it relates to the application of technology and running a global firm. And what, what, what would be the biggest talent implication, do you think? Well, for, first and foremost, if you think about sort of the ability to align an organization globally and to drive engagement, uh, which, by the way, creates the, the, uh, the engine for the 20 percent or the idea of the 20 percent, you know, the difference between a, a force, a, a set of colleagues who are excited about a mission and driving it and those who are kind of lukewarm, you know, is a massive difference in the impact on clients. By the way, a massive difference on performance. You know, our, our research suggests 10 to 20 points of difference in terms of overall financial performance. So, you know, for us, implications are very profound. And, you know, we don't call it experimentation because we like to pretend like we've got a good game plan and we're getting it right. But we try lots of things over and over again and try different approaches to try to create greater connectivity around the global firm. And we find that's fundamentally, it's just fundamental to what we do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know everybody in this audience, <laughs> but I do know Gita. <laughs> who's a research fellow at Oxford. We heard today that uh, uh, the average time that employees stay in a company is about 18 months, uh, especially in the US. Uh, in India, um, it is uh, under two years. We spoke, uh, we heard about um, data being open, personal, uh, I mean, very sensitive, competitive uh, information, profiles of people. Um, how do you secure that data? How do you um, secure the data in terms of yes. uh, respecting that's, privacy? That's a good question. A competitive advantage yeah. with people who may yeah. not stay more than two years. I must say, I was thinking about that as well when you when you talked about opening up the data. I mean, presumably, you're opening up some very sensitive data. I was. Um, I'm writing um, a case with uh, about TCS. Uh, with the CEO of TCS, a guy called Chandra. And um, they came to the same conclusion that if you, if you want to build a business that can evolve quickly, and they employ now 360,000 people, they, they need to open up the data. And that requires a, a very high level of trust, doesn't it? Because they're, they're dealing with commercially, very commercially sensitive data. Even yeah. more than trust, though, part of implicit in the question, very good question, is that the data is the competitive advantage. Yeah. Um, and if the data is the competitive advantage, you're vulnerable, sort of in the worlds that are being described, you know, completely opened up. The issue is, is if you can translate the data into, again, insight, have a process to do that, that's actually the platform which is differentiated. Yeah. Then, by the way, you accelerate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And the more data and the more content, the better you are on the platform. Then you ask the question, is your platform duplicatable? And if it is, you're still vulnerable. If it's not, you've got a competitive advantage that might be sustainable. If not, you better go back and think about it. Um, when I describe the supply chain effort, by the way, we keep our data, so we protect it. Like, you know, so, so to be clear, we don't have open data. We have Aon's data and our clients' proprietary data. So I'm, gonna work, I'm working on drinking this Kool-Aid. This is very good. But, <laughs> you can drink the 20% whilst you're exactly, at it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's what I need to do. But what's clear to us is we've been able to amass enough data that it isn't about that, it's about the process. The process is largely non-duplicatable in the world of risk we live in and the world of, of health and, t and talent we live in. That, in our view, is the competitive advantage. And I think what these gentlemen are saying is that's a completely different mindset uh, than the whole mindset of, you know, it's all about proprietary, you know, benchmark data. It's all about proprietary cost data. Uh, mm. It's got to go beyond that if we're talking about what, what they're mm. describing. I would just say, I agree. Ah, Marcus Alexander. <laughs> Hello, uh, Marcus Alexander, a faculty member at London Business School. Uh, first of all, I've been absolutely fascinated with you know, the comments and so on, but a challenge I get from a lot of companies I work with is, you know, this is all great for TMT and for you know, risk management, financial services, but a lot of us are in completely different sorts of environment. 
And part of me thinks, you know, yeah, that's true, but isn't there a lot that, that is learning for a, a wider group? Just wondered if you, if you had comments on that. Mm -hmm. So Marcus's question is, you know, what, could, this, could some of your ideas be used for other types of industries beyond your, I mean, let's go on, to, you know, you talked a lot, I mean, really for me, uh, Greg, your takeaway is that you have this data, but what really adds value is the insight uh, and the way that you build insights around those data. Right. I mean, is that something? Yeah, I, listen, I think it's completely transportable everywhere. I mean, Aon, Aon serves, uh, you know, in the worlds of risk and people, it really, we're a global focus group. We serve the biggest companies in the world, medium-sized companies, small companies, less pure personal, but some. Uh, and 80% of our business is middle market, small commercial in every country in the world and in every sector of the world. So all the financial services companies, all the manufacturing companies. So from our standpoint, the concepts about value added, at the end of the day, it isn't about AN at all. It's about can we help them improve their performance? And them is all these companies. So our view is this says high applicability you know, everywhere, and I got to believe Google <laughs> feels that, you know, times two uh, in terms of sort of the applicability, because it isn't about the industry. It is about literally how you use data and analytics to change behavior that drive value, and that is a lesson, at least from our humble view, that uh, is applicable in a lot of places. Mm. Well, Thank you so much uh, to Easy, Richard, and Greg for an absolutely fantastically interesting panel. It is the final, sadly, the final panel of, the, of today, but I hope we manage to keep the conversation moving along. So thank you so much to us. our three panelists. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much.